वासुदेवासुतम देवम कंस चनुरा मर्दनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्णम वंदे जगत गुरुम I salute the Lord Krishna, the world teacher, son of Vasudeva, destroyer of Kamsa and Chanara, the supreme bliss of Devaki. So the subject for this evening was uh, supposed to have been uh, to do with mysticism, but I thought that since we are still in the aftermath, as it were, of Janmashtami, the birth of Sri Krishna, I may as well repeat some things I said last night at our Janmashtami celebration, for those who missed it, and see if I can weave the topic into the subject of mysticism. The topic of last night's talk was Vedanta and the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, I mentioned last night that many people don't really understand or know what is Vedanta. So we have to explain that. Some people who think they know, maybe they haven't quite grasped it and what is the significance, particularly in connection with the Bhagavad Gita. And why the Bhagavad Gita is because this is the opus, this is the great, great work of Sri Krishna. Every incarnation that comes to us, and not every religion accepts that concept, but every incarnation that comes to us, avatara, the thing, the entity that descends to us, in order to change, to transform the world, each one is a transformer, each one is a, rena a renaissance person somebody who is a reformer. And we see in the Bhagavad Gita how all the concepts and strands of Sri Krishna's day are brought together by this author Vyasa, a remarkable author who not only combines all the essences of the Upanishads into this text, this longest philosophical poem in the world, but significantly after each chapter we find that it is declared Unupanishad. After every chapter, we find a repeated verse indicating that not only is the Bhagavad Gita and Unupanishad itself, not in the classical Shruti sense, but certainly from the Smriti sense and also from the Shruti sense in the sense that it doesn't contradict anything in the Upanishads. And the Upanishads is the basic text for the Vedanta. When we say Vedanta, we also mean Upanishads. It's a way of describing Upanishads. But after each chapter, we are told, Iti Srimad Bhagavad Gita Supanishatsu Brahma Vidyayam Yoga Shastra. It is Yoga Shastra. It is a scripture to do with the technique of how to unite the apparent dividedness that we experience with that unity of existence. And so Vedanta, it is a Vedantic text. There are three classical principal texts that we need to study for the Vedanta as a basis. Many other texts elaborate the subject of Vedanta. That is the Upanishads themselves. When we were studying on Saturday, the description by Shankaracharya of the meaning of Upanishad, he indicated that it was some knowledge that was delivered nearby. We can get the idea of sitting near a teacher. And some people may even have the image of sitting at the teacher's feet. And uh, so it is an Upanishad. We can sit at the feet. In other words, in order to study all these texts, Bhagavad Gita, the second part of it, this Prashthanatraya as it's called is Bhagavad Gita itself, and the third component is all to do with coordination, 
of these Upanishads, systematization explanation called the Vedanta Sutras or Brahma Sutras. Vyasa contributed two of these and organized the Upanishads. So we have to take it that this Bhagavad Gita is actually a text on the Vedanta philosophy. And in fact, in the Gita Dhyanam that sits up front, the very first passage within it declares Om Partaya Prati Boditam Bhagavata Narayanaina Swayam Vyasena Ratitam Purana Munina Madje Mahabharatam Advetam Rata Varshinim Bhagavatim Asta Dasha Dhyaya Inim Ambatam Anusandatami Bhagavad Gita Bhavad Veshinim. Oh, Om Bhagavad Gita, which, with which Partha, that is Arjun, was enlightened by the Lord Narayana himself, and which was incorporated in the Mahabharata by the ancient Muni Vyasa, the Divine Mother, the destroyer of rebirth, the shower of the nectar of Advaita and consisting of 18 chapters upon thee, O Bhagavad Gita, I affectionate, O affectionate mother, I meditate. There's a number of interesting and beautiful concepts here. First of all, when we take a scripture as opposed to a novel or any other book, the idea is that we meditate on it because all these texts came out of meditation, then explanation, reflection, and logic, and then by the word relayed from generation to generation and eventually put into written form and put in such a way that there can be no mistaking because it is according to certain meter, certain rhythm. The great mantra, Gayatri, is named after the type of meter in which it is written. It's all poetry and prose for easy memory and brings out the inner beauty now, the inner beauty is one of the descriptions that mystics use to describe some inner journey. The Katu Upanishad tells us that normally we're interpreting the world by looking outward. How do we know something exists? Only because the senses are there and the objects are there, suitable to be captured and the mind is there to interpret it, it is all outward moving. When we decide through inner wisdom to reverse this process and to take an inner journey, we have now begun religion. Religion has now begun. When people make general comments about religion did this and religion did that, they're only talking about the outer generation of it, the dogmas, the doctrines, they're talking essentially about man-made entities full of power and power grabbing. If you look at the history of some religions that are prominent today and powerful today, you'll find that they were obsessed with the extension of egoism. And that resulted in an exclusivism which said, only our religion, only my way, and all other ways are wrong. It's a way of consolidating power. And along with power comes pleasure. So that many of the leaders, we won't name exactly, many of the leaders of these religions were more like the operating mafia of today. They were more obsessed with family de designations. They were not concerned necessarily with the very morals and precepts and ethics that they espoused. It is very tempting to fall into this and then we lose all love. And just to remind you, Swami Vivekananda has a great definition of love, triangulating it, saying, love has no fear, no rival, and no reward. If we apply this to all relationships, including human relationships, we would have solid relationships everywhere with everyone. But when a religion itself makes things fearful, when a religion itself says there's a reward or there's a punishment, and when a religion claims exclusiveness, there is no rival to us. 
then there's no love in this. There's no love in condemning somebody to the eternal fires of hell. It's a contradictory message. If we are serious about God is love, then that is a love that has to be experienced. And earlier we focused on Shri Krishna or alternatively any other chosen ideal. It could have been Christ. It could have been any of these incarnations who came down. And they all have this one characteristic. They are the very embodiment of renunciation. They're the very embodiment of this quality. And the Bhagavad Gita is all to do with renunciation. Ramakrishna commented, when you repeat Gita, 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 it becomes Tagi, 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 which is a way of saying it's to do with theme of renunciation. But what do we mean by renunciation? Do we mean the world is evil and we should cut it off? No. That's not renunciation. And that is quite clear from the whole message of the Bhagavad Gita. Please engage in the activity. Your spiritual destiny is the, from the starting point where you find yourself now. What is the spiritual journey for a housewife? It is to be a housewife. What is the spiritual journey to be a student of a student? It is to be a good student. So wherever our skills and our talents and abilities, and we can truly say they are God-given, because they are expressive. Think of it this way. All the qualities we find in that entity that we call God, all the qualities of radiance and beauty and bliss, of goodness and purity and strength, all of that we find in mankind. We find it in nature itself, but it finds its culmination in this work of art called man. And there are many people who think, Man is the lowest of all creatures because look at the damage man does. But then the wonder is in the, the freedom that is behind everything is evidenced and manifested in the freedom of choice that a person has. Both the Gita and the Katu Upanishad indicate up front as a primary teaching that we have a choice. There is either a preferable path or a pleasurable path. Most people choose the pleasurable side because they are looking outwardly. They are interpreting the world in an outward way, taking the objects in the world and saying, our whole existence, our whole livelihood, our whole meaning, our whole purpose is invested in these things. And so the inner mystic journey gives a different story because the inner spiritual mystic journey indicates that there is a step-by-step -step process, like climbing up a mountain, or like going inward, or you can use a number of different analogies. Let us say a stepladder. You don't start off at the top. You have to start off at the first rung, second, third, and so on, progressively climb up. Anybody who gets frustrated has lost the joy of life itself. So renunciation is not renunciation of joy and life and living. No. And renunciation in bhakti yoga, which is particularly emphasized in the life of Krishna and, and, and elucidated as the preferable way, the easiest way, in the 12th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, which a young boy recited for us last night. Emphasizing the importance of it because it's an easy way, it's a sweet way. It's a way that collects and mobilizes all the emotions and gives expression to them. What person has not felt sorry in their life? What person has not wept? What person has not felt enormous emotional pain and distress. And there are many opportunities in this world to see it. Man not knowing these values has put their inhumanity to man and applied it everywhere in a spirit of selfishness, not generosity. But countering it, there are people who respond generously. I'm talking now more specifically of world refugees. People 
abolished slavery something like in the early 1800s. Certainly by 1830, slavery was formally abolished in Britain. Today, there are more slaves than have ever been, been before in the history of man. Slavery is a prominent blot on the landscape of humanity today. And it is all stems from this interpretation of the world and this understanding that this is all the world we have, we have to make the most of it, and we'll ignore the deeper issues of life. The mystics don't take that approach. They don't see things as a progression, something like a career progression in life. They see something, so they see their journey as an inner journey, going through ever increasing subtle layers of experience. Each layer unfolded being more immense, more subtle, and more meaningful than the preceding one. And this journey that is hastened with the nectar of love, love is the revealer of it. And this, with this love comes to a mystic experience described by the great Sufi mystic Ibn Arabi as a triangle, the beloved and the lover form two corners of the triangle. And then love itself that transcends it all. We form, first of all, we form a, this relationship, the beloved and the lover. This is described beautifully in the Bhagavatam. And I mentioned last night, and I highlighted particularly Swami Vivekananda's comment on that. If we read the whole passage about the life of Sri Krishna, there are some remarkable openings and awakenings that are related to mysticism. Just to remind you, of course, that Kamsa was a very powerful king. He was prepared to murder his own daughter and his own son-in-law on the basis that he himself felt there would be a threat to his power. It's something internal due to a kind of paranoia that we all have. Somebody will upset my status quo. Somebody will deprive me of my pleasure and my power. And that creates a kind of madness. The Bhagavad Gita describes it beautifully. We start by reflecting or brooding on an object that we desire. And then we get frustrated because when the desire is not fulfilled, whether it be a desire to connect it with your own self-image, or whether it is a desire for an object or a thing, whatever the desire is, when we don't get it, we get angry. We see this among children. When children don't get what they want, don't get their way, they use a the technique, stamping feet, crying loudly, and they're astute enough to strategically do it in a supermarket. And the parents now are, have the awkward position of dealing with a scene, you see. But how different is man, fully grown adult, the same thing, but of course, it may vary from mild frustration, restrained from within, to an outburst of anger, and sometimes it's justified, righteous indignation. The world should be like this, the world should be like that, as if God made a stupid world. From God's point of view, God made the world and saw it was good, only we see it as bad. So there are these various episodes there, and it culminates obviously in the long, cut a long story short, within the birth of Krishna. And Vasudeva has this great vision where he is commanded to take this child across the sea, across the water, river. Now it reminds me of the Christian Saint Christopher. I mentioned this to a devotee yesterday. The Christians, to ensure safe traveling, they have a small medal, and on there is Christopher, that is, the carrier of Christ. 
is uh, portrayed as a man with a beard and carrying a child on the shoulder across a flooded river to the other side. And the story goes that a small child seemed to be in distress and had to get to the opposite side of the river and life in danger. Christopher takes this child, puts it on his shoulder and with a staff wades across the river and the child becomes heavier and heavier and heavier and heavier. But the willingness and determination of Christopher, it gives him strength and he carries it across, 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 cuts to the other side and the child reveals itself as the Christ child. That's the story. So we can imagine also Vasudeva carrying the child across the river and going to the village where eventually King Nanda's village and where Yashoda becomes effectively his de facto mother, brought up in a rural surrounding, portrayed delightful, delightfully there. So we are all familiar mostly with this story, but then there are significant, significant sub-stories along the way. One thing, of course, is the child Krishna is also called Hari, that is the thief, because the story goes, steals all the butter, and butter being yellow, Hari also means yellow, golden yellow, we can see how Krishna steals away our hearts and takes away our sins, rescues us in this way. But Krishna has a reputation for being extremely naughty. And so the story goes that one day he was still a little baby. Some boys saw him eating mud. And when his foster mother, Yashoda, learned of it, she asked the baby to open his mouth and get the mud out. Now, when we read these stories, we have to now have a philosophical and mystical bent of mind. The mud surely represents the earth itself. Mere earth, and a child should not eat it. That is, we shouldn't consume with pleasure all the offerings of the earth with a sense of possession or obsessiveness or with attachment. We should take them as a gift, freely given, that we dance and sing in and experience the glory of what is there, repeating, what a glory, what a glory, not what a pity. And so, Yashoda learns of this and she asks the baby to open his mouth and Krishna opened his tiny little mouth. And the wonder of wonders, what did Yashoda saw? The same kind of thing as Arjun saw in adulthood, the whole wide universe in the mouth. And we can imagine how that looked. The earth, the heavens, stars, planets, sun, moon, innumerable beings, parallel and parallel universes, all within the mouth of baby Krishna, whirling galaxies, the whole thing, all within this mouth. And for just a moment, of course, anybody would be bewildered, thinking it was maybe a hallucination. But then the real vision she understood, the vision of her little baby as God himself, the cosmic creator. And of course, she soon managed to compose herself and prayed thus to the Lord of love, May thou who hast brought us into this world of Maya, may thou who hast given me the sense of consciousness that I am Yashoda, Queen of Nanda, the mother of Krishna, bestow thy blessings upon us always. But soon, of course, there's a forgetfulness that comes in because the baby is now behaving normally after that. And looking at her baby, she saw him smiling. And she clasped him naturally to her bosom and kissed him. Yashoda saw him as her own little baby Krishna once more. And of course, he then becomes very naughty. She has to bind him. And even in that story, we can see we are all bound. But who is bound? She binds Krishna to a tree. Who is bound? And she has a rope and she can't find the end of the rope, this endless bondage we have. 
not realizing it is Krishna alone who is binding himself. That realization has undawned on us. So that in the last message of Krishna separately published, the 11th chapter there called the last message of Krishna, Sri Krishna sometimes called the Uddhava Gita. And therein we find Krishna declaring, know that this is a play on myself. This is Maya on me. This is my own Leela Maya on me. It's not a cruel joke on you. That was told. So everywhere we find these great messages when we study these stories in the Bhagavatam. But then we come to the sweetest evidence or sweetest elucidation and allegory of this wonderful, wonderful mystic love on this mystic journey that we come across, the sweetness that we find, where we also find at the end of it, the Godhead as well as the God, the formless as well as the form, the one leading itself to the other, the one dissolving itself into the other in one perfect love, pure being, and the great mystic, German mystic, Meister Eckhart would have said that every quality you find in man is really a quality of God. And it is not so much a quality, just to avoid the confusion, as the essence of God. That is, God is strength. God is love. God is generosity. Any virtue you find in man, you'll find as an essence of that Supreme Being. Think of it now. We can see that we have three basic centers within us. When we do the Enneagram, we describe these as light, life, and love, centers of consciousness. If it wasn't for the fact that that Supreme was pure consciousness, we would not have intelligence anywhere or even self-awareness. If God was not this love, then we would not, or this bliss, we would not have love anywhere. We would not have an inclination to be happy. We would not have any inclination toward fulfilling that happiness through pleasure. So even the lowest derogatory end of this is an expression of the very highest. We would not feel that we exist if it wasn't that, that Supreme was existence itself. Now we come to this chapter where Sri Krishna is clearly the embodiment of love. And love is divine and is expressed in many different forms. And to Yashoda, the God of love was her own baby Krishna. But to the shepherd boys, Krishna was their beloved friend and playmate. And we can adopt all these different bhavas or attitudes in our spiritual journey. Krishna was their beloved friend and, and playmate to the gopis. And, but to the gopis, the shepherd girls, Krishna was their beloved friend, their lover, and their companion. And it is this deep love, this deep portrayal of God as a lover that is one of the highest forms, if not the highest form. Ram Krishna practiced this as he practiced every single approach and avenue. He said that for a man, this kind of relationship should be from the woman's point of view. And with that in mind, he acquired women's clothing, ornaments, and so on, acquired women's gestures, feminine gestures, and, uh, and uh, behaved entirely in this feminine way, putting himself exactly in the position of Rata, and exactly that union happened. Rata and Krishna joined together, becoming one. Rata does not come without Krishna, and Krishna does not come out without Rata. When Sri Krishna played on his flute, these shepherd girls forgot everything and conscious even of their own bodies. They ran to him, drawn by his great love, says the Bhagavatam. 
and once Krishna, to test their devotion to him, said to them, Oh, ye pure ones, your duties must first be to your husband and your children. Go back to your homes and live in their, in their service. You need not come to me, for if you only meditate on me, you will gain salvation. But the shepherd girls replied, Oh, cruel lover, we desire to serve only you. You know the scriptural truths, and you advise us to serve our husbands and children. Uh, so let it be, since that's what you command, we shall abide by your teaching. But since you are in all, and you are all, all by serving thee we shall serve them also. Krishna, who gives delight to all and who is blissful to his own being, divided himself into as many Krishnas in order to satisfy these lovers. And they all, as it were, they all danced and played with them. Each girl felt the divine presence and divine love of Sri Krishna and felt that he was their own. And each felt herself the most blessed each one's love for Krishna was so absorbing that she felt herself one with Krishna. Nay, she knew herself to be Krishna. No division. That is, in Ibn Arabi's terms, the loved and beloved unite in one union of love. Truly has it been said that those who meditate on the divine love of Sri Krishna and upon the sweet relationship between him and the shepherd girls become free from lust, from sensuality. Now, Swami Vivekananda gives this important note. He says, of the episode in the life of Sri Krishna recorded in this chapter, are the most marvelous passage of his life, that is Krishna's life, the most difficult to understand, which none ought to attempt to understand until he has become perfectly chaste and pure. That most marvelous expansion of love, allegorized and expressed in that beautiful play at Vrindavan, which none can comprehend, but he who has become mad with and drunk deep of the cup of love. In an earlier reading today with a devotee, we picked up a passage in the Gospel of Ramakrishna. One person seeing how he went into ecstatic love, first of all into samadhi, and then into a state of ecstatic love. And the devotee, curiously, once Ramakrishna had come down to normalcy, as it were, asked, ah, how can I get such love? How can I develop love for God, was his question. And Ramakrishna gave the answer, yearning. You have to yearn for God. And then he gives this example of the miser that yearns for the loving and the attachment that the miser has for money, the relationship that a husband has for a wife, and all of these things. So the earthly relationships that we have, we gather all that energy together and distill it into one, one ocean of love for God. Only in that way, when you weep, when tears come to your eyes, when that yearning becomes desperate, when you gasp for breath for it, then you see the sun of knowledge dawning. You see the beginning of the realization coming, comparing it to the announcement of the dawn before sunrise. Who can conceive the throes of love of the gopis, he continues. The shepherd girls, the very ideal of love, love that wants nothing, love that even does not care for heaven, Love that does not care for anything in this world or in the world to come. The historian who records this marvelous love of the gopis is one who was born pure, the eternally pure Sukha, the son of Yasa. So long as there is selfishness in the heart, so long is love of God impossible. It is nothing but shopkeeping. Oh, for one, one kiss of those lips, one who has been kissed by thee, his thirst for thee increases forever. All sorrows vanish, and he forgets love for everything else but for thee and thee alone. 
I forget first the love of gold and name and fame and for this little trumpery world of ours, says Vivekananda. Then alone, then, will you understand the love of the gopis. Too holy to be attempted without giving up everything. Too sacred to be conceived until the soul has become perfectly pure. People with ideas of sex and of money and of fame bubbling up every minute in their hearts, daring to criticize or interpret the love of the gopis. I remember a story, I don't know if it's true or not, in one European country where there were people teaching this uh, bhakti yoga everywhere and teaching the message of Krishna. And uh, some people who were objecting to it, Christians objected to it, brought the people to court and say, said, we have to stop this because it's teaching immorality. Look how many wives Krishna had. See? And then uh, the defendant said, well, yes, he said, but um, every nun who takes a vow of nun in the Catholic Church becomes a bride of Christ. How many wives Christ has? And the argument ended there. So one of the great, great South Indian devotees, I studied with uh, or I brought this out for a South Indian devotee yesterday. And it's the life of the remarkable woman, Saint Andal. Actually, the word Andal is the feminine equivalent, really, of uh, Ashwa. There are these Ashwa great mystic saints. And she is the only one of these, and she is called by the feminine Andal. And so the fact that she is called this, the feminine version of it, is itself telling. Anyway, uh, she was born uh, some 50 miles southwest of the famous Madurai and uh, born in uh, a town, uh, Shrivilo Putur. And uh, this uh, town was uh, really associated with the Vaishnava devotees, devotees of Lord Vishnu. She was said to be the eternal divine queen of Prema. That is ecstatic love of God. This love comes in gradations. We can easily see it with human love. The first comes interest. And then comes uh, something more than that. Time spent together. And then comes attachment. And then comes deep love. And then comes ecstatic love, what in human love is called biological chemical love. The chemistry kicks in. And then there's an internal euphoria. And this is exactly the same, but in a heightened, more real way. Since God is real and the world is not at the end of the day. And so her selfless, pure devotion to God is quite evident. And uh, so there's a, an article on her. This is an article taken from Women Saints of East and West, a compilation done some time ago. It, has a, it was uh, published on the birth centenary of Sri Sharada Devi, Holy Mother. And there's an introduction by Kenneth Walker, the great surgeon, M-A-F-R-C-S-O-B. And uh, under editorial advisement of Swami Garanda and others. And so we can see that it is a London publication. Anyway, I'll try and give you excerpts of this remarkable life so that you can get a flavor of the mystic journey of bhakti, of a bhakti. Bhakti yoga, the mystic journey of a bhakta. All right. As in the case with so many of the great saints, the entrance of Andal into the arena of the world and her exit, hence, are shrouded in mystery. 
Nonetheless, she was a historical personage who lived in the middle of the 7th century of this current era. That is, more or less before the birth of Shankaracharya, and it was a, in a, an area where uh, Christianity was only a few centuries old. She claimed that Bariyaswar uh, of Sri Vilaputta was her earthly father. She considered her like that, just as Sita would have considered Janaka as her own father and he her own daughter. And tradition says that this saint, this is called Pariyaswar, was engaged one day in digging and turning a soil in the garden of Tulsi plants. As we know, Tulsi is sacred to the worship of Vishnu and is taken as a token of Vishnu himself. When suddenly his attention was arrested by the mysterious appearance of a fair young girl, bigger than a baby, lying under a plant. This is how the story went. And the childless saint looked upon the girl as his own daughter, divinely bestowed upon him, and named her Goda, that is, the one who was born of Mother Earth. So like the miser coming in sight of his treasure, the saint appreciated her worth and brought her up in the lap of extreme affection, made her undergo the customary purification rites that is current among the Sri Vaishnavas and, uh, and in that particular time, and uh, uh, performed the duty of imparting the spiritual instruction suited to her age and to her capacity. Now, uh, she had instinctive devotion to the Supreme Being, and in this attitude, uh, our, she made a, a vow as to be a sworn vassal uh, to her liege lord. In other words, to start the process of an enamorment with the lord of the universe. So, being out of love for the devotees with a view to making them feel and enjoy the rare bliss of divine communion on earth, um, that is, uh, that is the, the, the saint, he used to make garlands of flowers. I'm trying to summarize this a little bit without reading the whole thing. That's why I'm hesitating here. So, the saint was illiterate as he was. Suddenly, in response to the call of God to establish the truths of religion, he found himself miraculously endowed with profound knowledge of Sanskrit and skill in dialectics. And once he was blessed with the vision of God of entrancing beauty before his physical eyes, and such was the flood of parental affection that it awakened in his heart that instantly he composed hymns in Tamil, attributing attributing to the Lord perpetual life. After this, his devotion took a new turn and assumed the form of a deep and abiding motherly solicitude for the divine child Krishna, as in the case of Yashoda of Vrindavan. For the rest of his life, he lived mentally and spiritually in the land of Vrindavan with the cowherds and milkmaids and delighted in the spiritual experience of Krishna Leela, the divine sport of Krishna. This is a background. So, with this background, it's no wonder then that such blessed parentage and spiritual heritage should have quickened the unfoldment of Andal's inherent spiritual genius, even at the tender age. Andal was born with prema, with this inherent ecstatic love, like the Tulsi with its sweet aroma, and was brought up in an atmosphere surcharged with fervid love of Krishna. Her pure, feminine nature, sensitive to the most delicate shades of conjugal love, easily responded to the gopi ideal of spiritual marriage with Krishna. Even from her childhood, she began to look upon herself as the destined bride of the divine enchanter of Vrindavan and reveled in ceaseless contemplation of the charms of his love and glory. Yeah, pause there just to reflect a little bit on that, how beautiful that is. 
One day, to test her own fitness to his bride of beauty, she surreptitiously decked herself with the garlands intended by her father for the local deity, gazed at her one own reflection, and then replaced them. And since then, day after day, she played the same game in the strictest privacy, and her father was unknowingly offering the used garlands to the Lord. You use a garland, you can't really suitably offer it to the Lord. But one day, the Aswa, happening to see her standing with the garlands on, reprimanded her for her profanity and forbade her to repeat the irreverent act. That evening, he couldn't decide whether to offer the garlands, but to his astonishment, the Lord appeared before him in a vision and commanded him to offer thenceforth only those garlands that were enriched in their perfume by their contact with the pure prema form, the prema form of Andal. And the next morning, the Aswa apprised his daughter of the Lord's behest and requested her to wear the garlands herself before offering them to the Lord. Realizing now her identity with the Divine Mother and Rule of the Universe, he named her Andal. It is not that she was born like that, born as a divine incarnation. It was that this connection, just as Radha and Krishna become the same entity, two sides of the same coin. So the lover of God becomes so near that the nearness becomes oneness and they become one. Just as any human relationship, you know, in marriage, the two partners are said to be one unit whether they know it or not, or believe it or not. Now, as Andal grew in age, her wisdom and devotion began to ripen day by day until it took the form of a passionate and irrepressible longing to marry God. Unable to hear, in other words, to be a bride of Krishna, just as nuns become a bride of Christ, but in a real way. Unable to bear the agony of separation from her beloved and the pangs of unrequited love, she was driven to the necessity of resorting to the measures taken by the gopis of Brindavan, the love-stricken milkmaids, who were in the self-same plight with regard to Sri Krishna. And this is not the only instance we find. In other religions, we also find this. We find in the Spanish mystics, for example, we find in Catherine of Siena and all of those, this understanding that they are really married to their Lord. Her rich and powerful imagination transported her to the pleasant woods of Brindavan and the sweet streams of the Yamuna, the Yamuna River, there fancying herself to be a gopi, pining for the presence of Sri Krishna she rose early in the morning in the auspicious winter months of December, January. And after bathing and decorating herself, she went with the ostensible purpose of fulfilling a vow. And this was the vow. In a congregational procession with her own companions aroused from sleep to the palace of the sleeping beauty to wake him up and pray for the boon of Parai. Sri Krishna is roused and takes a seat in the audience hall, ready to listen to their petitions. Now, here's the thing. Imagining, imagining a scene like this makes it a realization. It brings a vision of it. It becomes a reality. How so? Because we are using the revealing faculty of Maya itself. Maya has three aspects to it. Hiding, Projecting and revealing. It is the projecting and, re and hiding part that we try to avoid. We try to see through it. But we can only do it by the grace of the revealing function. Only the divine grace can intervene and reveal this reality, this law of the universe to us. And so by imagining, by imagining the scene, in detail and acting it out even, it came to be. So we continue. 
Andal, the leader of the party, prays for nothing, earthly, and craves only the privilege of eternal loving service to him alone, and for his sake alone, bound as they were to him by inseparable soul ties forever. He beautifully put. The whole scene is portrayed vividly in her immortal lyric, Tirupavai, the, so the Song Divine, a poem of 30 stanzas. Now she was a prolific poet, actually, and we see that she was compared to the uh, great uh, Greek poetess um, that, uh, that is mentioned in uh, Greek culture. So the, uh, she was described as a burning sapo, endowed with the pure passion of Krishna Prema, love of Krishna, and her li whole life was a poem of the growth and fulfillment of that divine bridal longing. What a passionate fervor of mystic love for Krishna is revealed in the following translation of her own verses. Let us read it. Of course, I'm reading the English translation of it. Ye jeweled damsels dwelling in resplendent Gokura, tis hallowed Dhanus now with nights of silver blaze, so high with we hence all bathed and pure to where he lies. The glorious son of valorous Nanda, sharp speared and keen, the mighty whelp of Yashoda, the beauteous eyed, the Asia hued, the lotus eyed, whose mien both cool and fiery becomes Narayana, Lord who alone could grant the boon of Parai, which gives the bliss we crave. O glorious mighty Cupid, God of love, I pray thee, understand the penance I perform with body, foul, hair disheveled, eyes pale, and a single meal a day. O Lord, to thee I wish to speak a word, just for the sake of preserving my life. Grant me the boon that I may touch the feet of Lord Krishna. O songbird, Many a day my bones do soften, my spear-like eyes know no wink. Plunged into the sea of the distress, I am in plight, failing to secure a ferry boat, the lord of Vaikuntha. Thou too knowest the keen pangs of separation that torment those in love. Can you not call my beloved lord of golden hue, whose banner bears the royal eagle? Ye clouds compassionate, my luster and hue, my bangles, mind and sleep have deserted me in my lonely affliction, so that I may perish. Can I engage myself in singing the auspicious qualities of my Govinda, residing in the hill of Venkata with cool waterfalls, just for preserving my life? The sense of shame is of no avail henceforth, for all and sundry have come to know the fact. If you would without delay find the remedy for restoring me to my past condition and save my life to take me to Gokula. Being crushed under the feet of that cruel, callous son of Nanda Gopa in the world, bereft of all respect, I cannot stir. Fetch me the dust of the place trodden by that brazen-faced youth and smear my body with it, for then alone my life will not depart from the body. So it's a wonderful, wonderful life. And notwithstanding the consoling, mysterious, and rapid growth of Andal's pure devotion to God, her attainment of marriageable age cannot have but have filled even her saintly father's mind with anxiety regarding the choice of a suitable human bridegroom for his precocious daughter the gem of his entire childless family, family, family. And one day, to sound her own feelings in the matter, he gently queried, Daughter, whom dost thou choose to wed? And Andal responded sternly, If I heard I had to wed a mortal, I could not bear to live. How then should I proceed? The father inquired. I intend to marry the Lord alone. 
This was the bold reply. And Pariyaswar then recounted his father, his darling, uh, to his darling, the characteristic and divine glories of each and every one of the various special manifestations of God and watched her reactions to the glowing descriptions. It was patent to him that her preference was for Sri Ranganatha, the Lord of Sri Rangam, in the, on the banks of the Kauri in South India, since the mention of his glories enraptured her beyond all bounds of maidenly, maidenly control. And after this, Andal cherished fond dreams of being united with him in wedlock. Thus ended or overall after many mystic experiences, uh, including uh, visions where she walked straight to the Lord's side and had a vision like this and stood by him and uttered in astonishment and bitter regret of all the onlookers when this entity vanished from mortal sight. So this is a brief, brief story of Andal. And if you want to read it in English, it is contained in a book, Women Saints of East and West, with a, former, with a forward by B.J. Lakshmi Pandit and an introduction by Kenneth Walker. The mystic journey is a rare journey. It requires, first of all, a resolve. And the resolve is based on a discernment. There can be nothing meaningful in life. There can be nothing worthwhile. If I just evaluate this life as it really is. That's not to say we downgrade it. Not at all. Because we see the Lord in, in it and working through it and ultimately as it as well as beyond it. That means that the whole of life becomes a great dance of joy. That means that we love every single wave of it. And we don't discern, we don't categorize into good and bad. We don't categorize it into praise and blame. We don't categorize it into good and evil. We accept it all as the divine drama this divine Leela Maya, the Lord Krishna playing the game on himself, not on another, and leaving us such a legacy, the greatest legacy there, with all the events in, in the life of Krishna, the greatest legacy is this Srimad Bhagavad Gita. I recall, I think I've told you many times before, there was one devotee who said, look, we're really ashamed. We don't know all these things. We don't know the Bhagavatam. We don't know the Bhagavad Gita. We've never read any of the Upanishads or studied anything. We know nothing of Sanskrit. You seem to know all of these things, you know. But yet, you say that the Bhagavad Gita is a simple text, but when I open it, I can't understand anything. No doubt, because it's a poem. It's, a brief, it's written in brief stanzas and designed to be heard and reflected on and then meditated on. But the hearing part, how will you do it? Well, the hearing part requires some commentators, some competent teachers, and every author or leader or initiator of a new school of thought that still comes under the label of Vedanta, approaching the subject bit by bit until we arrive at the Absolute has made their commentary on this text, on this Bhagavad Gita. So I said to this person, I said, look, let us have a class. Every week, we'll sit down and we'll go through this Bhagavad Gita. I did it with the Hindu Cultural Center of Ireland. And uh, uh, there's one devotee here who has resolved to uh, laboriously um, transcribe that, 
or at least you know put it into uh, edit it anyway at least that much it was over two and a half years the person who agreed and thought it was a good idea and suggested it never came to the classes at all it's very interesting so if we are to make any inroads like any journey it requires a first step and the first step requires resolve the second and third step require more resolve otherwise you just give the journey up by the hundredth step you should have had a hundred times more resolve until it is automatically it is a not even in question that you will proceed with your journey it requires a strong yearning a strong desire it requires determination and dedication and when you have all these three components you are now embarking on the mystic journey the inward journey of delight the inward journey which seems somehow out of place eccentric to the ordinary eye but becomes enlightening to the inner eye of the mystic and you cannot hide it because as jesus said you cannot hide your light under a bushel or a bed it becomes self-illuminating it shines through every pore of the body and when we we were discussing with a group the universality of religious art and how great saints and sages are portrayed and divine beings and so on are portrayed with a kind of halo and they're discussing we wonder what is the origin of this and i said well i can tell you that you see once you see god once you have reached a certain culmination a certain ecstatic experience of bliss in this inner journey your face will shine with it there'll be an aura around you irresistible how is it that a jesus comes to people whose occupation is fishing and says come follow me and immediately without knowing who he was immediately they followed him dropped their nets completely and followed him what is the charisma of the person who is who does that what is the charisma of a ram krishna what is the char charisma of a um, a buddha a jesus a chaitanya what is the char charisma of these great saints and sages what is the charisma of a krishna and a rama that has to last for thousands of years and we still not only follow their teachings but still are enamored with their beauty and their glory there are some traditions who want to keep that image of krishna at a young age of 16. that's good for the imagination not very practical for historical purposes but still to retain that image just as a young boy and then to adopt this loving attitude as we have found in this life of andal is a glorious glorious thing and so on behalf of our event yesterday for those who could not attend happy janmashtami to you belatedly from yesterday that was today's theme and uh, so we'll pick up a different theme next tuesday so Om Shanti 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 Peace, peace, peace be unto all.